Should we give people one more minute and then, or do you think it'll be fine? All right. Go for it. Okay. Um, I was very, very proud of myself because I was in the car at 20 to 6 this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it, no, no, the dogs. I had to go home for the dogs. Um, and I was incredibly proud of myself because I, I was, I had even remembered that we had not handed out the free book for the best question yesterday, but it wouldn't have been fair because I think the questions were very equal. They were all interesting and useful. So my feeling was that I was going to collect, if anyone w was perhaps interested in getting my earlier book, The History of Horses, we could do a raffle. We could, um, if you were interested in it, you could just write your name on a piece of paper. We could put it in this fine tin that I was proud of bringing from home. And then um, we could just draw two names. Because in a sense, you know, all questions are useful. And it's really difficult to evaluate one question being better than another. So I was so proud because I thought, what an elegant touch. And at 20 to 6 in the morning, you know. And then, of course, I forgot both the books at home. <laughs> but, no, but that must not deter us because I will simply post them to you. So we'll just draw the two winners and I'll just post it to you. So, um, of course, you don't have to enter the competition. If you really do hate horses like the grumpy man who hated my previous course, maybe don't enter. But if you're interested, it's, it's not a training manual on horses, but it is, of course, a history of this non-native species dating right back to the mid-17th century. So, perhaps I'll... Um, well, that, no, well, yes, or what I could do is I'm going to draw the winners now, like in the session, and then those two could just come give me their addresses so people don't have to dish out their addresses. You never know what I might do with them. Um, yes. So shall I, like, pass the tin along? What if people sabotage and take me? Who knows? Okay. All right. Excellent, excellent. Look at that piece of elegance. Yes. It was published by Wits University Press, but bookshops, they, it's in the exclusive books, but um, exclusive books adds quite a bit to the price, I see. So it's better to buy it on Loot or, or Cal, um, not Kalahari? Is it Kalahari? Take a lot. It Take A Lot, thank you. Kalahari was taken over by Take A Lot, which indeed it did. And it's much cheaper on those sites. Uh, that's what I found, yeah. But thank you for your interest, good heavens. My heart is warmed by that, excellent. Um, are we anxious about the car? Shall we wait to hear from the security guards? Because I feel we should just press on ahead. Yeah, so the, the trick is to write your name and stick it in the tin. Excellent. The, the last thing before we start our lecture today is to work on signals to me if you can't hear me. So I look to you at the back to lead me in this matter. You must signal to me, maybe just flash, if you can't hear me, or, or just a discreet wave is also completely fine. Completely fine, yes, excellent, good. And also on that side, if you could wave if you don't hear me. At any time, please feel free to interrupt and just say, listen, Sandra, talk slower and louder. It's fine, it's really fine. Okay, any questions before we start? I will take questions on yesterday's lecture at the end of today's session, simply because we didn't have a lot of time yesterday. So today we can do that as well. Yes, in the front. Just briefly, have you um, mentioned any information or whatever, just finding out about the animals per se, um, you know, some new historians? Yes, I have had. I'm part of the British Animal Studies Network, which includes historians, literary studies people, but also vets. So I have had my work vetted, as it were, by, by talking to um, and, and presenting in Glasgow, actually, last year. I was um, keynote at a, a conference which was mainly vets. And um, many were puzzled, but most validated my, I suppose, assumptions that I'm making as a historian, which I find a great relief. This is a, a, a liminal and, and dangerous space for a historian as well, because we are very interdisciplinary when we write critical animal history. And, and one doesn't want to, it's reckless to assume you are master of all arts, you aren't. So I certainly do take seriously the contribution from colleagues. In fact, there's a primatologist here today as well. And I couldn't be more excited because getting yourself checked is, is so, so important if you're writing this kind of history. 
the glaring errors one can make and that I have seen. Luckily, I do also, as well as being a historian, I do have an MSc in environmental change, which I have found helps me. My study when I did the MSc was on African wild dogs intersection with domestic dogs in Wangi National Park years ago, but it has helped me to understand the scientific literature, so I'm grateful for it. Yeah, but it's a good point, thanks. Yeah. Any other points? Otherwise, I think we should start. And we're going to start with a bang. 2015, the big news of the year was the discovery of Homo naledi. South Africa was excited. The scientists announced another new fossil from the cradle of humankind, this wonderful Homo naledi, a species maybe two and a half million years old. We were at once excited, dazzled, proud as South Africans to be at the forefront of this find. But at the same time, almost immediately, there was a stern disavowal from Zwellenzima Vavi, our leading trade unionist and a Marxist. Vavi tweeted, no one will dig old monkey bones to back up a theory that I was once a baboon. When he was challenged with the evidence and scientific consensus of evolutionary theory, Vavi responded, then prove I was a monkey before. Please don't bring these old baboon bones to me. Others tweeted in response that they were created in God's image, not that of ancient apes. The president of the South African Council of Churches, Bishop Siwa, agreed with Vavi, adding that it was insulting to claim that black Africans were descended from baboons. The former chief whip, now the political angle gets in, the former chief whip, an African, African National Congress MP, Macheka, declared that it was actually the whole Homo naledi thing was a scheme by the West <laughs> to depict black Africans as subhumans. And immediately there was a growing chorus of knowing voices ridiculing these fossil fictions violently objecting to what they had called baboon hysteria. But how do we understand these responses? What are we to make of this? I think, as active citizens, we can't simply laugh this stuff off. I think what we need to do instead is to, of course, take a step back and to explore one of the lineages the historical pedigree of why people are arguing this and why they are thinking this way. It's not enough to just call this willful ignorance or um, anti-enlightenment thought. You can't simply dismiss it. These are both very, all three men are extremely powerful in their different spheres. Something is happening here and we can't just dismiss it. Instead, we must look at a long history at least back to the mid-17th century, but I would argue far, far longer. We need to actually take ourselves right back to the fundamental shift in human-baboon relationship. And this occurred with the shift to pastoralism. I'll explain what I mean in a moment, but we're talking thousands of years ago. And this is an old relationship. We need to understand then how this knowledge base shifted over time, which gives us today the contradictory but overlapping bodies of knowledge held by university professors, school teachers with different ideas about evolution, students, and of course the churches and the political sphere. So why did a trade unionist and a bishop both uh, disavow kinship with a baboon when a hominid fossil was discovered. Homo naledi was seen as part of a pseudoscientific conspiracy theory dating back 500 years to connect Africans to baboons to justify their oppression as subhumans. Intriguingly for me, the objections had very deep roots in the crude history of social Darwinism. Darwinism, of course, taken one step too far and imposed upon people, imposed upon a kind of taking of the old great chain of being and creating a toxic taxonomy, a hierarchy of humans. And we all know who in this 
racist hierarchy was on the top and who was at the bottom for the long periods before, of course, the 21st century. But at the same time as this crude social Darwinism was causing the bishop and the, the trade unionists to say, no, no, we are not baboons, there was also another factor, in fact, the antithesis, anti-Darwinian creationism, really um, an attack on the theory of evolution from a more religious side. So it's Darwinism taken too far and the disavowal of Darwinism that brings together the two strange bedfellows of the Marxist, trade unionist, and the bishop. But there are many earlier examples, interesting ones, some of which I think you will remember. Ex-Bantustan leader, Lucas Mangorpi, sued Water Affairs Minister, Keda Asmal, for calling him a baboon. A white supervisor referred to African miners as baboons, and this case goes right back to 1976 with Ari Paulus, um, a label a magistrate considered even in 1976 to be unacceptable. A middle manager was taken to the Equality Court for calling the African National Congress a real monkey government, and the president the biggest baboon controlling the monkeys, was taken to the Equality Court. A Durban businessman was ordered to pay 15,000 rands worth of damages after a 10-year-old boy, his son, returned from a party with I'm a monkey painted on his chest and I'm a gorilla, misspelled, written on his back. It was 10 years ago. The father testified, I was very upset by this reference to an African person as a monkey or baboon. It's invasive of our human dignity. In a very different case, African youths laughed at a British tourist in Zululand calling him a white baboon. And I think also you might recall a certain university principal of the University of KwaZulu-Natal who brought down upon him the wrath of the dethroned white male baboons by referring to male, white, older academics as baboons. Do you remember that controversy? Mm. The National Police Commissioner also referred to a foreign murderer accused as a murdering monkey. The public protector then had to come in and force an apology out of him, not astonishingly for his impropriety at labeling a person still to face trial as a murderer, no, no, but for the monkey part of, of the insult. Incredible stuff. Julius Malema at the time when he was the ANC's firebrand youth league president, he attacked the opposition leader, of course, who was Helen Zilla at the time for dancing like a monkey. Mm. He also warned an anonymous whistleblower who had found, um, do you remember when there was a whistleblowing corruption scandal because Malema was getting those um, tenders, those corrupt tenders? He said, if there is a baboon, come and explain yourself, you coward. You don't have a face, you bloody ape. I don't even need to mention Penny Sparrow, okay? In all these cases, the public erupted in support, in rage, in agreement, sometimes in disbelief. So in South Africa, what I'm saying is monkeys matter. These scattered vignettes I've mentioned from modern post-apartheid society reflect these physical, spiritual, discursive, but also the political power of the monkey metaphor, the simian simile. My current research, this is the book I'm writing now, Baboon, A Human History. I fear it's going to be wildly unpopular, but, but I'm doing it and I go, I, a lot of it comes from the mid 17th century, those early Dutch East India Company records. One of the big problems in starting the settlement, baboons. But that had changed the lives of the local baboons, who of course prior to that time had not had standing crops upon which to feed, but I'll come back to that. My research tries to understand both players, both powerful primates, Homo sapiens and Papio Sinus. By analyzing our shared history in South Africa, 
I really want to offer a social history of the relationship between human and baboon, from their discursive deployment in South Africa's heated political present to historicizing their role in our social and political and cosmological imaginings. Monkeys and men have had a stormy relationship, as close family often does. The biological, the phylogenetic, and in fact the behavioral overlapping between humans and other primates have created this special historical relationship. We share evolutionary links, social complexity, visual signaling, brain structure, and childcare patterns, in fact, with extended infant dependency. In South Africa, the primates are, and I know you know this, but I'm just reminding you, the bush babies on the one side, and of course the baboons, your samango monkeys, and your vervet monkeys on the other. And our focus on today's talk is very much on baboons, but what is, what is, is very interesting is the easy slippage between them, between when people say monkeys, when they mean baboons or apes, it, it's, the slippage is interesting to me, the fluidity of the label. But sometimes it does matter. You will cast your mind back to that famous case in the South African police. I shall mention no names, but a man called Jackie Celebi was involved. But there, he was being sued for calling a subordinate a baboon. It was unacceptable. But it all came out when it went to court, of course, that he hadn't called her a baboon, he'd called her a chimpanzee. And that was considered completely fine, which I find very, very telling. There's something, yeah, we need to know. Why is that? Why is that? So I think part of the explanation for what is going on here is explained by a particular case study that I offer to you today. And it's part of this book, Baboon, A Human History, that I've been working on. I really, I use the case study as a lens into a much, much bigger process. I tell you the story, you can take other lessons from it. Because, ah, baboons at Stellenbosch University, this is very interesting as well. This was part of the Fees Must Fall Open Stellenbosch Initiative. The baboons were put, and then people could put anti-racist comments next to it, because some of the students um, at Stellenbosch, um, African students, had complained of being called baboons. People would shout. You couldn't see who it was shouting from one of the male residences. So I thought this was quite an interesting way of appropriating the label and then making it part of resistance art. I found this quite intriguing. It's up still at the arts building. The one baboon has seen better days, but I like the other. So let's, uh, let me share the case study with you. There's an incredibly strange document, a curious document in the Cape archives. And it's interleaved in a file of technical reports by medical authorities, university professors, and the South African police. And the document is a first person testimony of a feral child that came in from the wild. Really, I've never seen anything like it. The label feral, when I say feral child, the label feral is a slippery and dangerous thing itself. It's been variously understood as the untamed, the free, the natural, but also the unnatural, the primitive, but also the innocent. It is both a biological category but also an invented, socially constructed state. Somewhere between human and animal societies exist feral children, considered on a continuum, on a gamut, if you will, between half beast, half human. They have a very long historiographical pedigree. The father of history, the father of my discipline, is of course Herodotus. Two and a half, writing two and a half thousand years ago. We call him the father of history, the father of lies. But his work is full of these stories of children raised by animals. And of course, the foundational myth of Rome is Romulus and Remus, suckled by the she-wolf. But 
a little bit more recently, you've got stories of um, adopt uh, adoptions of these sort of children orphaned from human society but fostered by animals. You've got wolves, bears, apes. And these date back 1344, a child raised by bears um, um, in 1661, another child raised by wolves, then a child raised by sheep in Ireland in 1672. <laughs> But closer to home, closer to home. Burundi in the 1970s, a little boy found with a troop of monkeys. A little girl found in the swamps of southern Sumatra with monkeys in 1983. Um, Ugandan orphan, a uh, little boy they were to baptize John, found in 1988. He was three. They found him with a troop of monkeys. So the story goes. Um, Ugandan orphan, again, 1988 troop of monkeys. And then a slightly different case, very, very well documented. Moscow Street Child, very, they, were, they didn't know the exact age, but probably like four or five. A little boy living on the streets of Moscow with a pack of feral dogs. And in the day, the little boy would beg and share. And at night, the dogs would keep him warm and keep him safe. And he lived with them for two years before he was taken in. And it was quite a fight. They had to lure the dogs into a butcher's with meat to get them away from their pack member, this little boy. And it's authenticated. So these stories go on. These stories go on. But our story starts in 1939, with storm clouds gathering over Europe, the prospect of another world war becoming inevitable. But as the Nazis signed their Pact of Steel with Italy, and as the British fleet secretly mobilized, a significant proportion of the world's attention was turned to a rundown farm in the Eastern Cape at the southern tip of Africa. Their attention was turning, I'll come back to those, I promise. Their attention was turning to what Raymond Dart, South Africa's first paleoanthropologist, professor of anatomy, and budding primatologist, was calling, and I quote, the world's first modern, scientifically authentic case of a feral child raised by infrahuman primates. So let me read that again. The world's first modern, scientifically authentic case of a feral child raised by infrahuman primates. Well, the world's press was just calling him the baboon boy. And this is the story that was reported internationally and nationally. Over 30 years before, in 1903, two troopers of the old Cape Police were riding through one of the more remote and wild parts of the southeastern Cape. And they stumbled on a troop of baboons in a clearing. And in the spirit of sheer cussedness, not unknown to the South African police, they fired a few rounds into the group. The baboons scattered, petrified, but one trailed behind and was left in the panicked scamper. The two policemen assumed they had wounded one of the baboons, so they galloped up to the laggard, only to discover to their astonishment that it was a young African boy. The most striking feature of this boy was a massive scar, a terrible scar, down his forehead. They approached him warily, whereupon he, quote, jumped about on all fours and chattered like an ape. The two troopers took him, and they started investigating the local homesteads and kraals, trying to find out, was there any information about this child? They did hear that a baboon had stolen a baby years before, but that the family, fearing witchcraft, had not reported it or made any rescue efforts. They didn't really know what to do, so they took the boy to the Grahamstown Mental Institution where they dropped him off. In the hospital, they baptized the little boy, Lucas, and there they said he retained his, quote, wild ways. For example, he once consumed 89 prickly pears at a sitting, making him the cool hand Luke of the Eastern Cape. After a year, a local farmer named Smith apprenticed him but apprenticeship, as any historian will tell you, was actually just a polite word for labor with no pay. 
So he took him on on his farm, made him a laborer on his farm. Smith later said he knew the boy, Lucas, had genuinely lived with baboons because of his, quote, scratching of his body and his frightened grin. He said Lucas had indicated that as a child, his mother had been tending mealies and had returned to find him gone. The baboons had stolen him. And he said that the scar on his forehead had come from an ostrich because Lucas had been raiding the eggs from the ostrich nest and the, and the ostrich had retaliated. Smith also later explained that he had taught Lucas not to be wild anymore by thrashing him, especially as regards his animal habits. The story started to gain purchase. It was picked up by Ethelreda Lewis, the woman who discovered Trader Horn. Some of you will know of her. She wrote for the local press, picked up on the story. Then the local newspapers, Artspan, and then the Johannesburg-based Star, and a few other South African newspapers picked up on the story. And they published photographs of Lucas, but very posed photographs, emphasizing the myth of the story, the ferality of the story, asking him to pose in a tree, to lend veracity to the story, as you see. So after the Joburg-based star picked it up, then Lawrence Green, I'll come back to Lawrence Green in a moment, but many of you will know Lawrence Green as a kind of popular middle-brow author who wrote on South African history and exotica from the 1920s onwards. Then the London Times picked up the story, and after that, the New York Times, and then came the university professors. Professor Gerzel at Yale, Dr. Foley at George Washington University, Dr. Zing at Denver University, Dr. Gates at Bristol in the UK. Then Lucas really hit the headlines in 1939 with the possibility of a Hollywood movie based on his life called Tarzan of the African Felt. His fame burned brightest in mid-1939. Then it was doused, and when Lucas died in 1948, no one noticed. But with the strange afterlife of, of legends and myths, Lucas then popped up in textbooks, in the medical journal The Lancet, in the writings of the very famous anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, in the seminal text, The Elementary um, Structure of Kinship. He even recently popped up in garbled form in an American TV series called Is It Real TV? On it, the American historian says, I think it's to do with how whites at the time hoped to view Africans, almost like wish fulfillment. <laughs> Similarly, a recent history book um, on apartheid um, prints a picture of Lucas as a postcard form, which did appear at the time, and says that calling him the baboon boy was simply typical of the racism of the time. Now, it seems to me that such an explanation is extremely superficial, really cursory. It's lazy history, because this isn't representative of what was going on at the time. It's, in fact, completely exceptional. Equally, I think it is extremely glib to label this, to, to pin this incredible story simply on South African exceptionalism and also to maintain that it happened parochially only within South African borders is simply incorrect. So I think we really need to be a little more hardworking and unpack what was really going on here. It is certainly a story about racism, but it is not just a story about racism. There is more to it. I think the mention, the mere mention of baboon triggers, even now, a Pavlovian response, also in historians, because it's deeply entangled in the local politics of primates, that kind of, the politics of primate labeling that we started the talk with, and that triggers this knee-jerk Pavlovian response. In South Africa, the primate label still triggers 
disproportionate, intemperate, and hasty answers. We really do need to do the legwork here. And this brings me to the internecine war between people and baboons at the Cape. And we all know, as citizens, many of you will live, you'll live quite intimately with baboons. You'll have strategies of coping with baboons. I'm sure lots of you do, and you live with them. Just like in Durban, you, you live with monkeys. It's a close relationship. It's not a distant relationship like gorillas in the mist. These are baboons in the midst. They're here. It's a very different relationship we are able to have with those primates. So, but this, is, this was not always the case. And we need to understand this relationship has a history. We can't just look at a snapshot of the relationship. We have to look at the whole movie. And the whole movie goes back a long time. It's really it's like a scene from The Exorcist. <laughs> That's fine. So interestingly, for our purposes, and now I'm going to come to this idea of the baboon stealing the baby from the mother, that's how Lucas was acquired. For our purposes, it's quite interesting. There are several sporadic stories of abduction in South Africa's history. There are a lot in travelers' accounts, especially from the 18th and 19th centuries. Then in the 1920s, Eugene Marais. Some of you will have read his, I think, very poetic, beautiful books. Um, he writes with the fine hand of a poet that I could only wish to write for. The terrible thing, though, is that we mustn't ignore that he was also inflicting his work with a kind of popular social Darwinism. So, in the, in, for example, in one of his stories, he talks about a baby baboon that was brought to him by a local boer, and the boer asked him, listen, there's something very off about this baby baboon. It's got almost human features. Is it maybe possible that there was a, a relationship between an African woman and a male baboon or the other way around? And Eugene Marais, to, to his credit, of course dismisses it. But he is operating, you must understand, in a social milieu where that sort of thing could even be said, could even be thought. However, our thinking that and our saying that with sort of shocked horror, at exactly the same time, just on the other side of the world, in the Russian primate center as, as on the Black Sea, Sukumi, they were in the 20s, they'd done a lot of experimentations with monkey glands. Um, aging Bolshevik party members wished to feel young again. The early sap of the revolution had run dry. So they got these monkey glands attached to them by Russian scientists using also baboon glands. Apparently they felt a little bit better afterwards. And there were some scientists at that center who wished to actually crossbreed people and the higher primates with chimpanzees. And they couldn't do it in Russia, although a surprising number of Russian women volunteered. <laughs> no, I, I was very surprised. Although when you think of some people, you have dated. No, just joking, just joking. Sorry, just joking. No, no, but it really was a very serious thing because they had, oh, she's my sister, not just a random member of the audience. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> don't know. Um, gosh. Uh, no, um, so they obviously couldn't do it in Russia, they didn't get permission, so there was actually plans afoot to do it in West Africa, but luckily the whole plan was scuttled, and it couldn't, I mean, of course it could not have occurred. But, an important point to take from that is that this is not just a South African story that we mustn't again beat ourselves with the stick of South African exceptionalism. There are international trends at work here. And we have to understand this transnational history. There is a long story, We've, we talked a little bit about Herodotus mentioning all this, the great um, 18th century cla uh, classifier, the person who really divided the world into the species categories that we know, Linnaeus had a category for feral human which he called a subspecies of humans, Locoferus. And also Lawrence Green, very popular with white South Africans, writing a lot in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And he was really writing for a white 
popular audience, but he favored the genre of exoticizing the ordinary. And his books are kind of a romantic record of little remembered facts. And what he did in several of the books was popularize an ill-defined but still palpable 20th century version of the great chain of being. Remember that toxic hierarchy, basically white men at the top, everybody else a little bit lower down, and at the very bottom, the way it was structured, the disempowered and liminal members of society. So in his true tales, he talks about human children raised by baboons. He even has a sentence, and I'll quote, the chimpanzee is the most intelligent animal in the world. He flourishes in captivity and adopts human ways with delight. It is often said that a chimpanzee educated side by side with a black child would make faster progress. And this he's writing as late as the 1930s. He says, I'm convinced that rare cases of the adoption of children by animals occur and that the widespread belief in baboon boys is justified. Now, this kind of ersatz research, both reflected but also in its popularity, then contributed further to the zeitgeist that rendered the toxic taxonomy possible. And I think Lucas's story was at least in part believed because of this intellectual feeling, this intellectual milieu, which allowed it to be true. As we saw in, uh, in Lawrence Green's writing, the white reading public partly subscribed to the tale because they believed it could be possible that African children perhaps were closer to the primates. The long durée, if we then take a further step back and look at the long history between humans and baboons, the two primate species only became, as I've said, antagonistic at the Cape during the transition from nomadism, roaming around with your, um, well, of course, hunter-gatherers wouldn't have even any animals, but if they were roaming, or if they were roaming with animals as pastoralists, maybe just sheep or cattle owners, baboons are not a problem, they are not a threat. It is only with the coming of settled sedentary activity that created that fundamental ontological shift between us and baboons that shifted irrevocably and forever because we had stuff. We had stuff the baboons wanted and we were extremely vulnerable to their depredations. In the early days of the Cape, this was a really serious threat, but make no mistake, baboons and other animals that prey on the crops of sedentary people are an ongoing threat in the rural areas. We mustn't minimize it at all. The new relationship was further altered by changing European understandings, first of the great chain of being, and later, of course, with Darwinism. But it was also something to do with the philosopher the philosophies, you know, of Hobbes, something about the fact that our civilized veneer is just a shell on the outside, that deep within lurks this beast that can pop out if you don't impose civilization upon us. So in the last 150 years, to bring it a little more close to home, there have been at least 40 cases that I've tracked down. I've weeded out the obviously crazy stories, the tabloid fodder. I've weeded those out, but there are 40 cases that I've tracked down that made international news. That's in the last 150 years. There was an especially large number from another British colonial context, India. And from the 1860s, there was a slew of stories about children raised by wolves. Sir William Sleeman, the British governor in India, recorded several such cases of animal fostering of these kids orphaned by human society, taken in by lupine mothers, much like Romulus and Remus. His writings were a fine imperial blend of native jungle legend, Victorian adventure story, and then science. By the beginning of the 20th century, wolf children were so entrenched and the public understanding of India that they were included in standard works of reference and encyclopedias. Rudyard Kipling's father 
claimed to have encountered such a case, and of course his son immortalized the phenomenon in the Jungle Books with a character Mowgli, written in 1894. A little bit later, 20 years later, Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote Tarzan of the Apes, 1912. It proved astonishingly popular. There were 20 sequels by 1940. And both Mowgli and Tarzan, have people read Tarzan? Do people read Tarzan? I've read Tarzan. Okay, just, you know, it's like a few people are admitting to this. But we grew up in those stories. Oh, you all know the Jungle Book stories, right? You've read that, yeah. Tarzan's the Fifty Shades of Grey version of the Jungle Book. Um, I won't say that again. Okay, my sister is signaling me. Uh-uh, uh-uh, don't go. All right. Both Mowgli and Tarzan were prompted by these real, so-called real cases, and then at the same time reinscribed the ancient myths. Unlike the more vulnerable, pitiable, damaged examples from science of the feral children, Mowgli and especially Tarzan, were not subhuman or liminal or powerless, they were superhuman. In fact, Tarzan demonstrated that being an aristocrat, in fact, being an English gentleman, was so genetically ingrained that even being raised by apes couldn't dent it. <laughs> Lord Greystoke remained quite literally a noble savage. And Tarzan's story provides readers with the sort of thrill of the unfamiliar, but it's also really reassuring because the, the, the world was changing in 1912, heading up, of course, to the next great war. But his story sustained those, early, those Edwardian imperialist fantasies, as well as having vicarious adventures in the twilight of empire. But now we turn back from the fictional to the factual, although there was always a porous border between the two. In fact, both Raymond Dart at Witz and Dr. Foley from George Washington University called Lucas the South African Tarzan. So from June to July 1939, the world was fascinated by Lucas. The core academic interest was coming from anthropologists, psychologists, especially experts on childhood. And all of them were from overseas, except for Dart, who, as you know, was born Australian, but then he became professor of anatomy at Witz. And they were asking, what can we learn from the primates? What can we learn about child development? This was at the same time that a young couple, the Kelloggs, brought home a chimpanzee to raise with their little boy, Donald. So Gur was raised with Donald, um, just to see, you know, to monitor childhood development, but really to test the behaviorist Skinner's hypothesis that it was all about the environment, not the biology. It was the environment that made you what you, you were. So they raised the two in their home, but the experiment had to be abandoned because it all went terribly wrong when um, Gua humanized just fine, but Donald, the little human boy, started simianizing and started beating chest for food, and then the last straw was throwing feces. So he, they had to abandon the experiment altogether. Don't worry, Donald became an academic, so nothing funny about Donald. Um, no, we're fine. Okay, yeah. But the reverse experiment, the other side of the coin, putting a baby human among the non-human primates, the so-called forbidden experiment would not, could not ever be carried out. So when it seemed to have occurred naturally, as in Lucas's case, it got immediate worldwide attention. Enter Raymond Dot from Witz um, anatomy department, a bright star in South Africa's academic firmament. He thought primate studies were absolutely essential in understanding evolutionary change, particularly the so-called, remember he was the guy who gave us Australopithecus, the, um, the, the, the missing link, if you were, to put it in crude terms. And his thing was all about the fact that we should study baboons to know how we became humans because there was this predatory transition, the killer ape hypothesis, on how we had become humans by becoming, it was quite a Hobbesian vision, quite a dark vision of humanity, that we had become killer apes. 
And he was contacted by a cohort of American and British academics who were freshly interested in the case because at the same time, there were these two little girls in India that were purportedly raised by wolves and a little boy in Bengal that had apparently been raised by a wolf. But the little girls had died and it was pretty clear that the guy who was saying he'd found them with a wolf was actually running an orphanage and he needed international funds. So he had kind of constructed this legend. The Miawana boy had just disappeared and there was no paperwork. But Lucas was totally different. Lucas was alive. Lucas was telling his story. Lucas had been authenticated by famous academic Raymond Dart and by the police and by medical authorities. Science was going to use Lucas for the light the study would throw on hereditary versus environment. It would answer the classic question, which wins, nature or nurture? Would such feral children show human traits? Or, would they, would, or would, would they always be a wolf or a baboon at heart? Would the hereditary conquer the environment? Would such a child walk erect, talk, be able to imagine? Would they have a sense of shame or a sense of humor? Would they be permanently lupine or simian? And if that were the case, would there be a better wolf or an alpha ape? Alas. The excitement was a result of premature publication. Raymond Dart had a habit of sharing his research all along the way at all stages of his research. He didn't wait for the study to be over or for peer review. And also, although Raymond Dart was a very good scientist in many ways, he nurtured this deep, credulous streak about Africa. Maybe because he wasn't from here, Australian, but he believed in the myths of Africa. He believed, for example, Phoenicians that actually created Great Zimbabwe. He had these fantasies of the past, and he was very credulous in a lot of ways. So it became increasingly obvious that this Lucas story was a myth. And one by one, the academics backed away. Dart, Zing, Foley, Gessel, they all backed away. Because even a cursory, even a half-hearted examination into the facts of the case revealed the shameless, pecuniary, the, the monetary interest behind driving the baboon boy myth. What had happened was the legend had simply been started by the postmaster at Port Alfred in order to whip up a bit of tourist interest in Port Alfred. He had met Smith's laborer. He had seen the potential. He had heard the jokes that were being made. And he put Lucas on postcards and sold them for one and six at the station master's cafe. So Smith then also thought, oh, he's going to make a bit of money. And he tried to exhibit Lucas as the living baboon boy in East London. But the public objected, and the police shut down the exhibition immediately. The movie deal was pure fantasy. In 1939 then, just before the big story crumbled, a medical superintendent was contacted by the Cape Archives and asked to go and investigate for themselves. Because Dart had been doing his research from Johannesburg, he hadn't even met Lucas. And so the Cape Archives sent a medical a superintendent from the Grahamstown district to go and investigate for themselves. And he was, of course, quite reluctant, but he agreed. And when they arrived at the gate of the farm, Lucas had been standing there for several hours. He had heard he had a visitor, and he was waiting to salute. He was dressed in his kitchen boy outfit. And the doctor examined him, and he delivered, I think, a very dry, crisp, but not unsympathetic report. And he described Lucas in the nomenclature of the time as a low-grade imbecile. He did have that big scar on the head. It could have affected the Broca's area of the brain, which would, of course, have affected his speech capabilities and his ability to, to cope on a higher, an adult level. He confirmed that Lucas did make a formal statement of 152 words. I am an employee of Mrs. G. Smith of Farm Thornhill, Bathurst District. I can only recall a few instances of my life among the baboons. 
My food consisted of crickets, ostrich eggs, prickly pears, green mealies, wild honey. I was kicked on the head by an ostrich while raiding its nest. I was often stung by bees while robbing their hives. I fell over a crance while busy searching for food. I broke my left leg, and there was a lot of damage to that leg, the superintendent said. While, the, while with the baboons, I walked on all fours. I slept in the bush entirely naked. I was busy hunting for food one day with my baboon companions when two policemen shot with revolvers. I tried very hard to escape, but I was captured and carried away on a horse by one of the policemen. I can't recall the place or district in which the police found me, Lucas, and he made his mark. But, so the medical superintendent confirmed that the 152 words of his life had, had been said by Lucas. It affirmed his having been raised by baboons and that the scar on his head had come from being kicked by the ostrich. He said that when he left after the examination, there was Lucas again at the gate, saluting. He wrote there, a well-trained orphan, although now a man of almost 50 years. But there was an untold story written on Lucas's body. The superintendent noted in a little postscript to his formal notes, that the scars that concerned him far more than the one on the forehead were the scars scattered across his body. They seem to have been caused by hot cigarette ends, which may have explained how Lucas was taught to tell the version of his own life story. Thank you. Take your questions now. Yes, I see a hand. I see two hands. Yes. I did follow that. Yeah. Yes. My heart was very sore when I read of baby Phoenix who had died in the, uh, as a result of the fire. But it would be incredibly reckless of me. I can't pronounce on such matters because it is a complicated story. And I think that there is so much goodwill and good efforts on both sides of the divide, as it were. And it's not even a two sides to this, not even, you know, Capulets and Montague. It's, it's really a lot of people with a lot of different stakes in this. I, it would be reckless to say anything about the more recent controversies, but there's a very long history of managing baboons, and it's a history that primatologists should comment on and are working on, that it isn't a recent relationship. My work that I'm working on now is looking at the vermin killings, turn of the 20th century. It's incredibly easy. All the farmers' magazines are writing about how you get rid of baboons. So, if there's one little message of hope to take, is how much the public cared when little baby Phoenix, the baby baboon of one of the troops, died as a result of her burns from the terrible fire. People do care. I promise you, 100 years ago, they did not care. And it is that I take as incredibly hopeful. It's all I can give. I saw another hand. Yes, at the back. Yes, at the back. Yeah, please do add to that.
if I could come in on that point, I find that's something I'm working on with the most recent chapter. What is a very nice way to look at that is the tokolosh. There's quite a bit of crossover discussion through mediums like Krita Mutwa of the tokolosh as baboon, because it is like us, but it's totally eerie and different. It's like us, but, but unsettling and strange. And then he also uh, says one of the space aliens, because Krita Mutwa has now shifted into a shamanic space, is also a baboon. But it's all a metaphor, but so something is much more unsettling if it is almost like us, but not. No one's unsettled by a zebra, but there's something very, very, very scary about baboons. The almost us is much more disconcerting than the totally not us. I mean, just to, to, to back up what you're saying, yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. If you look at this from information we have the last two years, which is amazing, we've reduced the mortality mm. by 80%. I mean, exactly. The mortality in particular areas, like the Gama Park, I was going to say, that's famous, yes. The Navy houses. Yes. Once you name a baboon, it becomes that much more personal. With knowing her name was Phoenix, it's like the Cecil the Lion, yeah, yeah, yeah. phenomenon. It's a strategy. Yeah. It's, a strategy. it's yeah. Sure. No, I hear you. There's a lot to the story. Mm.